Now that we've covered just how translation works, again, I highly recommend you go check out the video. I'm going to post along with this to see everything moving in time. I want to talk a little bit about translational control, because just like in transcription, there is some stuff that cells do in order to stop or start things at the level of translation. Not quite as intricate as in transcription, but still there. So we're going to look at this interesting complex called ferritin. Ferritin is basic in the iron storage protein for, for animals, okay? Uh, it's got a subunit. The one little piece is coded for, for the gene for ferritin is actually for this ferritin subunit. And then you get 24 of those assembling together. And what it does is it snags up loose iron wandering around your body and stores it, oxidizes it, and stores it in a more um, safe form until it's needed again because uh, this iron just wandering around uncomplexed can destroy tissues and start pulling things apart and is not very helpful. Okay. Now to complete the system, we have two other proteins here, the iron response protein, okay, which can grab um, iron if it has to, and the iron response element, which will grab onto DNA, as we'll see shortly. But both of these are involved with um, keeping iron regulated in our bloodstreams. So let's walk through this slowly. So first, big deal, ferritin protein sequesters free iron. We don't need it if there's a lot of iron around. So when there are low iron levels, the iron response element binds to the mRNA that would be coding for ferritin. Okay, this is being produced and transcribed. The ferritin mRNA is floating around there. And we have the iron response protein binding on to that IRE site in the absence of iron. Okay, it sits there, hangs out. This prevents translation from the mRNA. The ribosome cannot make its way past that chonky boy IRP in order to get to the start codon. Okay? However, when there is iron present in the cell, suddenly um, this iron response protein, when it sucks up some iron, can no longer bond to the IRE. It lifts off. It uh, here I go on a honeymoon. Eee, off you go. And now ribosome does have access to the start transcription site because we need to make more ferritin now because that loose iron is going to be a problem. Uh, so the mRNA is translated and ferritin is made and now it can sequester that free iron that was bonking around messing things up. Okay. So Let's introduce another player, transferrin. This is a movement protein. It grabs iron and moves it through the blood uh, as opposed to storage protein. This needs, this gets iron where it needs to go. Uh, in terms of where iron is at the body at any particular point, about 65% is carried up in your red blood cells wrapped up in hemoglobin. About 30% of it is stored in ferritin um, in the liver and bone marrow and spleen. Uh, some is stored in skeletal muscles, and then the rest is out transmitting around the body bound to the, the iron binding uh, protein and transferritin. Okay, so in a more quickly usable form than when it's bound up in ferritin. So transferrin is really important for direct access of iron into cells, okay? And having like a low stable level of iron is really good. Okay, so here's our transferrin mRNA there hanging out, and it gets bound up around the three prime untranslated end with the IREs. Okay, the iron response elements there are, are there. This is, um, now this is not in the coding region, this is the untranslated region, the very tail end. Okay, uh, and while these iron response elements and, therefore, and then also the IRPs, the iron response proteins are bound. This is keeping the tail end of the mRNA safe from being degraded. So while they're sitting there at low iron levels, um, transferrin's being made, it's moving a little bit of iron into the cell and all is good. Now, low iron levels are essential. We do not want them to get too high. We don't wanna make a ton of transport proteins that are gonna shuttle too much iron into our cells. So when iron gets too high, the iron response protein, again, unlatches from the iron response element and grabs onto iron and floats away. Okay, now high iron levels are toxic to the cell. We wanna stop making transferrin, okay? And so when these lift off, suddenly the IREs are no longer protected and you get the exonucleases that chip away like a Pac-Man at the tail end of any mRNAs and start degrading it. Okay, so this is the, the feedback loop of there's um, too much iron here, so we do not want any more iron transport proteins in the cell. So 
that's sort of a in response to just whether or not you have enough substrate present, how much is there, how less is there. This is an interesting example here of how translation is regulated by literally position within a body. Uh, in this case, we're looking at uh, Drosophila larva. We're looking at how proteins are translated across different areas of a cell. We're going to be talking about the anterior, the front, and the posterior, the back of a um, embryo, a Drosophila embryo. We're looking at two main genes, the hunchback gene and the NOS gene, okay, NANOS gene, so HB and NOS. And eventually hunchback is going to make this interesting protein gradient shown here. But when we start out uh, in the cell, we have a lot of cytoplasm. All the cytoplasm is coming from the ovum from the mother. And there is like a linear spot. There is a spot on the cell where the, the maternal um, nuclei and DNA and stuff all sort of congregate towards. Okay. So when we start out, hunchback mRNA is evenly deposited by mom in the in the ovum, but NOS mRNA ends up being tethered to one end of the cell wall, and that's going to be the gradient there. It's uh, The NOS protein then forms a gradient from that posterior end. The NOS protein is going to block translation of the hunchback protein over time. Okay, So in the anterior position there, the translation occurs. Uh, HB protein is made up front. Nothing is happening. NOS is low, so the mRNA is being translated. In the back of the cell, uh, NOS is grabbing onto this other um, protein here and blocking full trans, uh, translation. So hunchback protein is not being made in the posterior there. You're going to end up getting this um, interesting gradient between the two because NOS blocks this translation of the mRNA. The uh, hunchback protein begins to form a gradient as well. From anterior to posterior. And this is going to, a lot of these genes um, are then going to have a sort of trickle down effect. And this is the very beginning of what makes the front of an animal the front and the back of the animal the back is literally like a two gene combination like these two, at least in Drosophila. A lot of other stuff starts coming in uh, once this um, uh, division, this gradient is formed.